All right, folks, here we are at the human population. It's my hope that at least some of you have had AP Human Geography um, or really any of the histories. Hopefully you talked about some of this stuff. We're going to be breezing through this next unit, which is chapters 8 and 14 in about four class periods. So definitely make sure that you absorb the highlights of all of this as we uh, move forward. Um, the good news is not a lot of uh, new information in here that uh, is going to be startling, at least I hope so, or I hope not. All right, here's section one. Uh, the first part is about China and the one-child policy. Now, it's really important for me to note that the one-child policy has been relaxed uh, since 2013. If one parent in a couple is an only child, the couple can then have two children. But let's go ahead and talk about this policy because it started to be enforced in about 1970. And as you can see from this age structure diagram, um, well, I haven't talked about this yet. Hey, this is an age structure diagram. This is like the ones that you built for class. Left side is males, right side is females, and it's essentially two bar graphs that have been stood up on their end and smushed together. And if you look at this, the majority of the population is young with a huge <coughs> portion, <coughs> excuse me, a huge portion of it uh, in what is called the reproductive years. So that means that this was back when China's population was rapidly growing without any end in sight. And given that China, although it's huge, it doesn't exactly have a lot of <clears throat> natural resources, not a lot of arable land, not a lot of water, and its uh, growth ends because of, of mountains and ocean, um, that something needed to be done. Uh, and for better or for worse, the communist country decided to go ahead and enforce a one-child policy um, before 2013. And the way that they did this was they used education propaganda, as you can see here on the left, uh, excuse me, on the right-hand side, um, to marry later and have fewer children. They increased accessibility to contraception and abortion. Uh, One-child families also receive financial and medical housing tax, job, and general access perks. Larger families were uh, socially shunned and discriminated against and received fines. So uh, the, a lot were put into place to go ahead and keep uh, the one-child policy in force without actually calling it a one-child policy. How are rural birth numbers removed to be kept low? through forced abortions and sterilization and then uh, forced adoptions when they came across a family that already had more than one child that had been born. Uh, what is a major result of this policy? There is a cultural preference for males in this culture, as there are in many cultures, because um, you pass things down through the, uh, the, the male the mat, uh, uh, line. Um, females did not inherit. Uh, Plus, it's just the, the idea of, of the name being carried on by males. We still see this in the United States. It's very much a custom for a woman when she gets married to take on the name of her husband. Uh, again, with that name being passed down uh, through uh, the, the, uh, the patrilineal side. Um, so, major result was widespread killing of infant girls because if you're going to have one child, you would like to have a boy a child. As you can see, there's even a, a boy pictured here in this poster, um, which then led to an unbalanced sex ratio, which has then led to a black market trade in teenage girls for brides from other countries like Thailand, as an example. And you can see that here in the, uh, the 2010 um, age structure diagram. I'm going to show you another graph here in a second that makes it very, very clear. And I know this doesn't look like a huge differential between uh, the left and the right, especially look at that 20 to 24 age group. But when you're talking about in millions, this is a huge, huge gap. Um, and uh, now, as you can see from the shape of this pyramid versus this one, you're definitely getting a slowing of the population. It's beginning to uh, population growth, and it's beginning to reach that column shape that is associated with a stable population. Now what's really interesting though is you're noticing it's a little top heavy and we're going to talk about what that means um, in a little bit. So um, here is what it, another result is people who didn't have the heart to kill their uh, female child would go ahead and abandon them in public places. The train stations were very popular especially if from a rural area you'd, you'd come to a train station deposit your baby and then leave. Um, 
before the one child policy was re relaxed, the overwhelming majority of children, infants in orphanages were female. Now, um, the overwhelming majority, because you can have two children, are, but only two children, um, are children with disabilities, are, are now left in the orphanages. Uh, hmm, I, wonder, I guess that slide is coming a little bit later on, the differential between uh, males and females, so just go ahead and keep that in mind. All right, in general, where does most of the world's population growth take place? That's poor nations like India. As of October 2011, what is the world's population to the nearest billion? Now, I, I won't put this on the quiz because this is technically uh, supplemental material, but do expect to see it on the test and do expect to know this. It's 7 billion with a B, so that is 369 zeros. And then use one word, word to describe the growth rate of the human population since the Industrial Revolution. As you can see from this graph here in the lower right hand corner, it is exponential. The only time we've really had a dip um, in that growth is the plague. And uh, beyond that, the Industrial Revolution happened right about in here, and you can see that our population growth has just gone unfettered. Uh, we're going to talk about all the reasons why that is taking place as we move through this chapter. All right, um, let's see. Uh, moving forward, some definitions you need to know, the difference between a developed versus a developing country. Again, I'll go over this in supplemental material, but you need to know this as I'm talking here. Developed countries are places like U.S., Canada, Eastern European nations, Japan, and Australia. Developing countries, decide, despite its size, that's still China, India, Nigeria, and most of Africa. This definition is linked to education level of adults, all adults, males and females, the standard of living, in other words, uh, indoor plumbing, um, you know, do you have to travel to get water, how convenient are things, the country's economy. Um, sanitation levels, that means uh, when one poops, where does it go? And then food security, can you count on eating every single day? And I know there are parts of China that are very developed, but the majority of it is still rural areas where these things are still at developing country levels. All right, um, and then here again, you can see uh, the population growth. Just to let you know uh, what's coming, because you are gonna be the ones who are gonna live through this part right here. There, there's no, this, this green part of this graph is best case scenario, and I think we've pretty much come close to this already um, in terms of population growth from here on out. Uh, as we've discussed with Thomas Malthus, when is it going to come that we uh, run out of resources for all the people on this planet? When is it that our population density will encourage the spread of disease that will start wiping people out? Who knows? So this just kind of gives you an idea of how big our population is projected to get. All right, we're gonna watch these in class. All right, the rule of 70. Um, explain how the rule of 70 helps to estimate the doubling time of a population. You are not gonna be responsible for on this particular quiz to do any calculations. This is math, we're gonna work in class. You will, however, need to know how to do rule of 70 math for your next test. When given a growth rate and a percent, do the following to figure out how long it will take for the population to double. Keep the percentage as is, divide that number into 70. The quotient, which is what you get when you divide, is the number of years it will take for a population to double if the growth rate stays constant. So here's an example. If the population of a country grows at a rate of approximately 5% per year, which doesn't sound like a lot, the number of years required for the population to double is closest to 14 years. So um, this really drives home uh, the power of exponential growth. All right, list four reasons why infant mortality rates have dropped globally. They're a little bit different here on the slide. Your book mentions technological innovations. Um, that's everything from cars to water purifiers to better uh, ways of, of growing food. It, it, it plays in all the rest of these, communication. Um, improved sanitation, better medical care, and increased agricultural output. Um, so you can see here, uh, sanitation systems allow the control of infectious disease, which we've talked about before when we talked about the Ganges River in India and in terms of untreated sewage rolling into the river. Antibiotics and vaccines also play a huge part in uh, the control of infectious diseases. Uh, vaccines do not cause autism. That is something we will discuss in class. Um, and antibiotics, up until recently work incredibly well in controlling bacteria. 
better medical care in gen general, but that uh, this specifically has to do with infant mortality rate. It's everything from prenatal care, which is the care of a woman when she's pregnant, um, hospital care when childbirth is not routine. Um, in third world countries where this is not the case, where women have to travel days to get to a place to give birth, you can die in childbirth. It happens routinely. Uh, NICUs, which is where premature babies go in other countries where this is not available. If your baby's born prematurely, it dies. If your baby is not able to latch on and nurse, it dies. Um, if there are problems during childbirth, the baby dies and the mother dies. Um, so better, better medical care in general has uh, caused infant mortality rates to drop. All right, um, this is just a kind of a side note, uh, not on your quiz, but something interesting, in that U.S. infant mortality rates are higher than other developed countries due to inadequate health care for poor women during pregnancy um, and for their infants, especially with um, places like Planned Parenthood that are being closed. A lot of what they provide is uh, care, reproductive care for women. Uh, drug addiction among pregnant teen women, and then high birth rate among teenagers, although uh, in recent years, that is, uh, the birth rates among teenagers is the lowest it's ever been. Um, U.S. life expectancy lags behind in other countries because no universal health care and high obesity rates. Being um, obese causes a lot of uh, health care problems that you do not find in, in people who do not carry that extra weight. All right, um, your next question says, identify environmental and economic consequences of human population growth. Climate change, waste and pollution, build up and all the things that that does, uh, habitat alteration, loss of biodiversity and ecosystem services. Uh, that was environmental consequences. Economic consequences include health impacts on humans, social disruption, uh, for example, a, an economy can go belly up if you have nothing to sell when crops can no longer be brought, grown in sterile soil because of poor soil management, and then more war, conflict, and refugees. When you're um, land stops giving you food and water, you move or you fight over what's left. All right, what is the IPAT model? Uh, side note, this is not an actual number that you're expected to calculate. This just tells you uh, the things that go into uh, how we think about environmental quality. Oh, by the way, back here. Consequences of human population growth is basically HIPCO for the environmental stuff that um, acronym I gave you in the last unit. All right, here, the things that go in IPAT, just in case this pops up on an exam, uh, you need to know this for the quiz. I stands for total impact, and that is the total impact that humans have in the environment. It's kind of a combination of the population that's in a particular area, and that includes its density, affluence, how wealthy are this the general person that lives there, and then how much technology they have access to. Um, the larger a population is and the more uh, concentrated those people are, the bigger um, of an impact you have. Believe it or not, affluence can cause a greater impact on the environment simply because when you want stuff you don't need, uh, constructing it leads to pollution and then uh, when you get rid of it that leads to waste and then technology is the same idea. Alright, um, be able to give examples of each. Uh, some also S, uh, add an S in here, so iPads for sensitivity of given environment. Remember that there are some environments with a low resilience, and once you mess with them, they never come back. Um, other terms could be considered in here, the general education of the population, uh, existing environmental laws, are there even any stability in the society? Uh, people who are going to war are not about conserving the environment. As a matter of fact, they may be about degrading the environment to, to uh, keep the enemy from reaping the rewards of that resource. Um, NPP, the, the net primary pro productivity of that area, how many trees and, and uh, plants are there in an area, and so on and so forth. All right, identify civilizations that end ended as a result of poor resource management. We talked about these uh, during the agriculture unit and also when we talked about tragedy of the commons, Easter Island, um, uh, the Mayans and the Mesopotamians, which includes Samaria and the Fertile Crescent, and right now we think it might be China. All right, describe ways in which China has an impact has impacted their environment in very little time. The increase in consumption of resources um, uh, to increase their material wealth, uh, expanding their intensive uh, agriculture. Um, uh, to an industrial agriculture has resulted in Dust Bowl-like situation, overuse of aquifers and um, the Yellow River, and all of the rivers really, 
um, pollution from car use. All of these things uh, have happened very recently and taken a big toll on the environment. As we're going to find as we move into the air pollution unit, China doesn't have any env environmental laws really. And here is just a small example of um, another way that uh, China has impacted the environment, the pork industry. So um, per capita, which means per person, they eat 81 pounds of pork. Um, the, uh, you know, again, they're growing grain to feed to the, the pigs. The average pig in China produces 5.3 kilograms of waste each day. If every kilogram is, I think, like a little over two pounds, uh, that's a lot of poop. And it contains nutrients, heavy metals, and pharmaceutical residues. I'm not exactly certain why it would contain heavy met metals, but definitely um, the pharmaceutical residues. Um, uh, and you can see all of the problems here that you know about eutrophication, uh, nitrates and pathogens, um, you know, all of this stuff we have talked about before. So that's just pigs. All right, so um, da -da -da -da, which part of the IPAT model impacts our use of MPP? Sorry, let me go back real quick. Um, all parts. Um, all of these impact net primary productivity. It's also important to note that one country's affluence and desire for goods and services can impact another country, even when that country's people are not the driving force for the resource use. In other words, stuff like cash crops and the harvesting of exotic woods, people who live there couldn't care less, being used in other places still causes degradation in the original country. All right, how have human overcome its natural limits on growth? Tool making, the advent of agriculture, industrialization, uh, medicine, sanitation, all that other good stuff. I didn't make a slide for that because that's kind of, we've been talking about this. All right, know the world's three most populous countries. I've seen this pop up before in the national exam. Be able to rank them in order. It goes China, India, and the United States. However, do realize that because the United States population is kind of stabilized, we're probably going to get knocked out uh, of the top three by about 2050. It's probably going to be India, China, and Nigeria. Why do we care about this stuff? Because where you have the highest concentration of people, especially poor people, and if you look, India, China, and Nigeria are all developing countries. Um, environmental conservation is not going to be a thing for them. So you're going to see huge amounts of degradation going on in that particular area. And because there is no way, what goes on there affects the entire globe. All right. Um, and here again, you can see um, growth and projected growth. Um, we are a clumped distribution, we as humans. We prefer steady climates in temperate, subtropical, and tropical areas. Uh, our lowest population densities are in deserts, deep rainforests, and tundra. We prefer areas with water source and or near the shoreline. Um, and we cluster in cities and suburbs. This is probably not anything new. If you were to do a map of the United States, you'd see the highest population densities in cities or um, near waterways. You know, we use water not only for drinking, but also as a pathway to transport goods. You probably learned about this stuff in world history and if you've had American history that as well. All right, um, give an ecological pro and a con for the clump distribution of humans. A pro is that it relieves pressure on ecosystems in less populated areas. The con is concentration of resource use and pollution buildup in high population areas. Um, and um, you know, the concentration of waste is like good news, bad news. Good news is it's all in one place and you can deal with it there. The bad news is very rarely are we set up to deal with all of it that's there. And as we rapidly grow, the systems we put in place easily get overwhelmed. All right, um, describe an age structure diagram. All right, um, the x-axis is population as a number or as a percent. And the y-axis is the ages of the people usually divided up into five and 10 uh, year groups. Um, the main difference between the two sides of an age structure diagram is the gender it measures, male on one side, female on the other. Definitely know these. Pre-reproductive ages are 0 to 14, reproductive ages are 15 to 44, and then post-reproductive is everything else. This matters because where the populations are the most dense in terms of age lets us know what's going to happen to this population in the next 20 years. If nearly 28% of the people on the planet are under 15 in 2008, that means that very soon you're going to have a population explosion because unless people, those people die, 
they're going to start reproducing. All right, and again, when looking at an age structure diagram, consider a country's present and future needs based on the represented population. All right, what, de what detail on an age structure diagram can indicate that a population will grow rapidly in the near future? What is a classic shape of an age structure diagram that indicates a population will grow rapidly in the near future? All right, um, look where the biggest concentration of, peoples, of people is on the graph. A diagram with most of the people concentrated in the reproductive years, which is 15 to 44, indicates that the population is going to grow rapidly in the coming years. A pyramid-shaped diagram, like the one here on the left, indicates a rapidly growing population. It is my suggestion to you that you memorize a country in each one of these four categories, expanding rapidly. That is pretty much almost all third world countries at this point, pretty much except for China expanding slowly you can put China in there um, really you could probably move the United States from expanding slowly almost to stable please notice what's happening to the pyramid it's becoming more and more of a column now look what's happening here declining Germany is a great example of this notice that the bottom is smaller than the top think about all the things that you can tell from this you can tell things like where are you going to invest in building schools versus building hospitals um, or, or um, places that, that um, nursing homes. Where are you going to see uh, a heavier use of resources? Where are you going to see jobs that skew towards the care of the old versus the care of the young? Uh, these, uh, where are you going to see a population explosion? These pyramids tell you that. All right, again, here's some more stuff for you and you can see some of the interesting um, quirks like you're going to notice that these two graphs of Sweden and the United States, the female population um, is larger than the male. Um, that comes from the hey watch this phenomena I like to call it, which is that males are less likely to go to the doctor and more likely to engage in ris risky behavior so they are more likely to die at a younger age. Alright, here are some other uh, examples again that are very um, graphic. Alright, so um, an age structure diagram can indicate that the average age of a population will become older. That would be where a stable or a declining population is. What are the implications? An older population means more dependence on fewer young people for care and financial assistance. It means more medical uh, transportation and living facilities for older populations, but there will be lower crime rates and more volunteerism. So, but here's a huge one, labor shortages. New skilled employees cannot balance the retirees. Uh, we're starting to see that here in the United States. All right, um, take a look at this. You can pause here for a second and read. All right, um, let's see. How can cultural gender pre preference impact a country's gender ratio? Uh, how can the preference eventually impact the overall population and population growth? Cultural preference for boys can lead to lower reproductive rates and an overall decreased population growth because there are fewer women to go around. However, slightly more boys accounts for higher mortality rates among male populations, as I had just discussed. It can also lead to the redistribution of young females from other countries, so they're pressed into service as brides. Here is what I am talking about. If this article, and I'm going to show you the graph from this article, says that approximately 30 million more men than women will reach adulthood and enter China's mating market by 2020. That is a huge number. To give you an idea, there are 301 million people in the United States total. All right, and here you can see that this uh, gender gulf has existed for a long time, but it has increased uh, here recently. All right, um, list four ways in which population can increase or decrease. Identify which factors cause a population to increase and which causes a population to decrease. What types of events may cause each of these factors to increase or decrease? Okay. You either come into a population or you leave. You come into a population by being born into it or immigrating, and you leave by either dying or emigrating. Deaths go down as a result of improved medical care, better food sources, etc. Immigration happens when war and bad uh, economies force a population, a working population, to move somewhere else. Um, Emigration, immigration can result as uh, war, famine, disease, degrading environment, poverty, and poor economy. All right, 
remember the difference between immigration and emigration. I think of E is exit, emigration, I is into, so that is immigration. All right, uh, how are TFR and replacement fertility different? TFR stands for total fertility rate, and it is the average number of children born per female member of a population during her lifetime. It is not how many will reach adulthood, it's simply how many she has. Replacement fertility is the number of children needed to be born so that they grow up and replace their parents. All right, uh, TFR and replacement level fertility are different. You could think of replacement level fertility as a subset of TFR. Uh, TFR is influenced by child mortality rates, the education level of women, and the rights afforded to women, so it will change from country to country. Um, replacement level fertility is the number of children a couple must have, so it's the TFR needed to ensure population, that the population stays stable. A higher infant mortality rate means a higher replacement level fertility rate, which is why the replacement level fertility is 2.1 worldwide at present. It means that uh, if every tenth family has three children, one of them is going to die. That is just um, before they reach adulthood. And uh, if that happens, and that ideally does happen given uh, the amount of risk that we have versus the medical care, our population would be stable. Of course, when you have a TFR that's higher than your replacement level fertility rate, that's when you have population growth. So, what are some reasons to have more children than indicated by the TFR, even when improved medical care has reduced infant mortality rates? Why do some families choose to have fewer children? Okay, I'm going to read you what's on my paper, and then I'm going to read what's on these slides. Um, all right, when you have more children, um, you have them, if you're in a rural area, uh, for labor purposes on farms. They also act as a social security for parents in places where social security does not exist. Uh, parents will move in with and rotate amongst their children. Also, when you have a high infant mortality rate and a high child mortality rate, you have enough children so that hopefully a few of them will make it to adulthood. Uh, reasons to have fewer children. Uh, in countries where kids are not allowed to work and uh, they have to be supported throughout their school years, there's it gets expensive. Um, when there's monetary forms of Social Security available, you don't need to have kids to support you. and um, this is something I'm going to drive home a lot. Women with a higher education and economic opportunities put less of an emphasis on child rearing. In countries where women can get a good education and have the ability to get a job, they have fewer children. Uh, educating women and giving them economic opportunities is a far better contraception than condoms and birth control pills. Um, also, let's see, yeah, that's, that's it for right here. My apologies. And also social pressures to have big families. Remember that it was the norm to have at least four children per family in the United States in the 1950s. If you had less than four, people would ask you incessantly when you were going to have more and what was wrong with you. Now, of course, when you have four or more children, it's kind of the opposite. What's wrong with you? Why do you have so many? Um, it's cheaper to have kids in developing countries because there's no mandatory going to school, uh, although in some other ways, if you are more affluent, it is more expensive to have children in uh, some other countries because in most places in the world, you have to pay for your child's education from elementary school. All right, we already talked about this. If you live in an urban area, urban means cities, you have better access to family planning. And we talked about infant mortality rate. Um, and again, this bolded one is huge. The average age of a woman at the birth of her first child makes a difference in how many kids she has. The younger a mom is, the more kids they have. Child brides are traditional in some countries. I mean, like 10 and 11. Uh, why? Because women die in childbirth. And so men will take younger children, uh, 10, 11, as wives, uh, to go ahead and make sure that they have children when they are the strongest, or perhaps their other wife died. And um, let's see what else. Uh, availability of family planning in general, including legal abortions and re reliable birth control methods. Some cultures do not allow for these things. All right, total fertility rate in Europe, as you can see, is these commas, by the way, are the way um, that other countries show decimals. So you can see that a lot of countries have a total fertility rate below the replacement level fertility. So you can see in these countries, their population is actually starting to shrink. 
which means fewer young to take care of more old. All right, and here's a TFR. This is not replacement level fertility, this is TFR worldwide. Remember, just because places are having seven and eight children doesn't mean necessarily that all of those survive to adulthood. And let's see if there's anything else I forgot. What is the TFR of many European countries? How has this impacted their overall populations? Europe has a TFR of 1.5, which means that populations are declining in 14 of 44 European countries. And then what major continental region has the highest TFR? That would be Africa. And that brings us to the end of this particular presentation.